Euclidean or Cartesian space is the environment for this course. The Cartesian plane is hopefully familiar to you, but I'm going to give a formal definitions regardless. This is part of the process of learning the formal language of mathematics, of taking previously known mathematical ideas and refining them in more formal logical ways. We start that process with geometric space and the vectors therein. Even if you already know a version, let me redefine what a vector is. In linear algebra and in many other branches of mathematics, ordinary numbers, integers, rational, or real numbers, are called scalars. Since I will be building other constructions out of numbers, it is nice to have this special term to refer just to the ordinary numbers. A vector is a finite ordered list of scalars. Formally, that's all the definition I need, just a list, a data type if you wish. All the rest of the knowledge of vectors comes from use and interpretation of the definition. Vectors can be written either as columns or rows. If a vector is a list of the numbers 4, 15, pi, and negative 3 in that order, I can write that vector as a column without columns, com without commas, or as a row with commas to separate the entries. In this course, I will exclusively use column vectors. In many other places, row vectors are common. I find it best to choose one of the two for the whole course instead of switching back and forth. For reasons I'll talk about in future weeks, column vectors are a good choice for this course. So let n be a positive integer. Real Euclidean space, or Cartesian space, is the space of all vectors of length n. It is written rn with this fancy double-lined r that you should be familiar with as a symbol for the real numbers. Rn makes sense here since there are n choices, each of which is a real number. To write an arbitrary vector in Rn, I'll use the variables x1, x2, x3, up to xn. These dots are very common notation in mathematics. They just mean that the pattern continues. In this case, the pattern is just the numbers in the vectors. Since there are n coefficients in its vectors, the space Rn has dimension n. I've defined this in full generality since I want to take advantage of the flexibility of this definition. Since a vector is just a list of numbers and that list can have any length, why not allow for all these spaces? Five-dimensional space, 25-dimensional space? A great value of abstraction is taking tools that previously only applied to specific cases and using them much more broadly. That said, let me remind you of the notations for the familiar lower dimensions. The number in a vector is called its entries, coordinates, or components. I'll use all three terms. In this general vector, whatever takes the x1 spot is the first component, and whatever number takes the x2 spot is the second component, and so on. Two-dimensional space is written R2, and three-dimensional space is written R3. To refer to an arbitrary vector in R2, I use the conventional coordinates x and y, and for R3, the conventional coordinates x, y, and z, for four-dimensional space, it is also conventional to use the letters W, X, Y, and Z, and I will use them in that order in this course. Every Rn has a special vector, the zero vector, the vector where all the entries are zero. This is called the origin of Euclidean space, and it is considered the center point of the space. This is geometry, so I want to actually see it. Euclidean space is visualized by drawing axes, one in each independent perpendicular direction. In this visualization, the vector AB corresponds to the unique point I get by moving A units in the direction of the x-axis and B units in the direction of the y-axis. I've shown several points here. The origin is not displaced at all and it sits right in the center. The vector 3, 6, you can measure the three units to the right x-direction and the six units up y-direction and likewise for all the other three points. This geometric visualization means that vectors, which were defined just as lists, now become geometry through interpretation. A vector is now not just a list, but a point in space. As with the plane, the vector ABC in three dimensions is the point displaced A units in the X direction, B units in the Y direction, and C units in the Z direction. It's harder to visualize this now on a flat surface since three-dimensional space is collapsed to two, but I can try. The point 1, 3, 2 is one unit over in X, three units over in Y, and two units up in Z. 
Drawing boxes also often helps to make the visualization of these points easier. Note in the online version of the notes, all the 3D diagrams are interactable. You can move the axes around and zoom in and out, and I encourage you to do this to get a better sense of the space. Note that I need to choose directions for the axes in both R2 and R3. In a visualization of Euclidean space, there are no predetermined directions for the axes. I have to make a choice. This choice of axis, axis direction in the visualization of Rn is called the orientation. I'll have more to say about orientation later in the course. While I can visualize R2 and R3 relatively easy and efficiently, I can't visualize any higher power Rn. However, this doesn't prevent me from working in higher dimensions. I need to rely on the algebraic descriptions of vectors instead of the drawings and visualizations of R2 and R3. And this is where the algebra geometry connection becomes truly remarkable. If I build the algebra to describe two and three dimensional geometry, I can use that algebra to describe four, five, and higher dimensional geometry as well. Even though I can't see these spaces, I can understand them and I can work with them. And that's amazing. Let me try and demonstrate how I developed this intuition for higher dimensional space. In the visualization of R2 and R3, I see the different axes as fundamentally different perpendicular directions. I can think of R2 as the space with two independent directions, and R3 as the space with three independent directions. Similarly, R4 is the space with four independent perpendicular directions, even though it is impossible to visualize such a thing. I just decide to define it anyway, visualization notwithstanding. Likewise, Rn is the space with n independent directions, de defined by fiat to exist. Before I finish this video, let me talk about two very tricky interpretation challenges for vectors. It's good to mention these two problems earlier, since they are common throughout this course and throughout vector geometry in general. I can think of a vector, say 1, 4, as the specific point, the dot, located as the, of those coordinates. But I can also think of it as the arrow from the origin to that point. The vector is both things, or rather, both of these are valid interpretations of what a vector is. In vector geometry, I switch back and forth between these two ideas frequently, often without explicitly saying so. A large part of learning to work with vectors is becoming comfortable with this switch, with thinking of vectors as both points and arrows, depending on what is necessary at the moment. In addition, there is another use of vectors as arrows. In the previous diagram, the arrows always started at the origin. However, I can start the arrows elsewhere if I want. What I get then is something called a local direction vector. Here's the vector 2, 2. From that point 2, 2, I can think of looking in various directions as if that were the origin. If I look directly right, I'm looking in the direction 1, 0, again, as if this point were the origin. If I'm looking up, I'm looking in the direction 0, 1, again, as if this point were the origin. Using vectors to define local directions is a useful tool. A standard example is a camera in three-dimensional virtual environment. First, I need to know the location of the camera, which is an ordinary vector starting from the origin. Second, I need to know what direction the camera is pointing, which is a local direction vector which treats the camera location as the current origin. Where the camera is, where the camera is pointing, two vectors, and the second a local direction. One of the most difficult things about learning vector ge geometry is becoming accustomed to local direction vectors. I won't always carefully distinguish between vectors at the origin and local direction vectors. Often the difference is implied and it is up to the reader or listener to figure out how the vectors are being used.